common refrain in the Becker household. I do it myself. You see, one of our daughters went through a phase around the terrible two age where she insisted that she had to do everything herself. She would not accept the clothes that we would pick out for her. In fact, sometimes she might end up wearing the clothes that we picked out, but only after she had looked through her drawer and decided those were the ones that she wanted. I do it myself, she would say, say as she shoved our hands away when we tried to help her with tasks around the house, whether it was getting dressed or washing her hands. In fact, if we tried to pick her up and put her at her spot for dinner, she would scream, no, I do it myself the whole way. And when she got into her seat, just to drive the point home, she would climb down. It didn't matter that the moment her feet touched the floor, she would climb back into the chair. The important thing was, I do it myself. I do it myself. That's kind of an amusing childish declaration, and yet, maybe you can understand, maybe even appreciate a little bit that desire for independence. After all, in just two days, we're going to celebrate Independence Day. And even though, as a country, part of our repertoire of, of ways that we celebrate the 4th of July Independence Day isn't to stand up and say, I do it myself. We think independence is a pretty keen thing, don't we? In fact, we do something that probably a lot of people would look at as pretty childish. We declare our independence by blowing stuff up with fireworks. We want everyone to know this whole independence business is good, it's wonderful, we like it. In fact, our independence is so important to us, it's so precious to us, that sometimes we struggle when we lose some of that independence, or when we have to acknowledge that we aren't as independent as we'd like to think we are. For example, some of the tensions that, that exist between teenagers and parents, some of them probably tie into that whole matter of independence. Those teenagers are no longer content with the independence of picking out their own clothes or getting into their own spots at the dinner table. Now they want some more independence. They want the independence to be able to maybe get to work or go out with their friends or maybe even go on a date without mom and dad hovering over their shoulder or, or calling them every 10 minutes to make sure they're all right. Or when you get a little bit past your teenage years, maybe some of you have struggled in your adult life with asking for help because you don't like to admit that you aren't strong enough, or you don't have enough know-how to take care of a task. You like to feel independent. Maybe there are some of you here today who have had an awkward or difficult conversation with parents, who reached the point in their life where they, they had to give up the independence of driving because they could no longer manage to navigate the road safely or because maybe they could no longer even live in their own home safely by themselves. We like to cling to that independence in part because it's connected to our pride. And for that reason, those verses that are, are before us from our second lesson from 1 Peter, they're verses that maybe aren't the most popular to hear. After all, the first statement of those verses was, humble yourselves. Humble yourselves. Not exactly the message we like to hear, especially not so close to Independence Day. And yet God knows that you and I, we've got a little bit more in common with overconfident two-year-olds than we'd sometimes like to admit. And so he doesn't politely encourage us, saying, well, maybe you might eventually want to think about humbling yourself. No, he just simply says, point blank, humble yourselves. And then, then God brings us face to face with some of the reasons why we need to humble ourselves, why he gives us that exhortation. There was that phrase in our text that said, casting all your anxieties on him. The word anxieties, that's a, a big word, it's an intimidating word, namely because of all the things that it makes us think about. 
Just think about anxieties for a moment. Think about the things that make you anxious and worried. Do you ever spend a sleepless night worried about your kids? Or an aging parent or a friend who's sick? When you went to your job for the first time, were you a little anxious, a little nervous how things would go? Or, or the first day at a new job? Or part of the way through your life? Be a little nervous if you'd be able to make the transition. Or maybe did you have a sense of, of loathing and dread day after day when you went into work and your company was struggling? And the talk around the water cooler in the break room started to, to center more and more on layoffs or cuts or closures? There's a lot of things to be anxious in this life, and yet. Yet when we're anxious, when we get worried about those things, it's in a lot of ways it's like we're saying, I do it myself. It's, it's kind of like we're putting on our own shoulders, on our own mind, the responsibility for solving those problems that make us so worried. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, our worries and our anxieties, they're very childish because they can't fix those problems. Our anxieties and worries, they bring us face to face with our limitations. Our Savior God this morning, he urges us to humble ourselves. But not just so that you see your limitations. That phrase I referenced from our text, casting all your anxieties on him. You maybe notice that isn't actually a full sentence even. Let me give you that phrase in its complete sentence. The Holy Spirit inspired Peter to write, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. God doesn't urge you to humble yourself simply because he wants to shove your face in the dirt like some bull. God doesn't encourage you to see your limitations because he wants to put you in your place as if you were a rebellious teenager. Now God urges you to humble yourself, to recognize your limitations, because he wants you to see the one, he wants you to see him as the one who lifts you up, who exalts you in those times of difficulty when you are truly beaten down by this life. Your Savior wants you to see that he is able to help you, and that he does help. Savior God, after all, has the power to do something about those anxieties that you and I are so powerless to deal with. After all, the Bible tells us the eyes of all look to God and he gives them their food at the proper time. If God can feed all of creation, including all the animals that don't even plan for their next meal, then certainly God has the power to care for your physical needs. Or think about this statement from Scripture. God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not then also graciously give us all things? God wants you to humble yourself so that you can see him as the one who raises you up in the difficulties and problems of this life. Now I could probably end the sermon right there. And that'd be a pretty complete thought, wouldn't it? It'd also be kind of nice and short. <laughs> However, Peter doesn't stop there, and we shouldn't stop there either. You see, God isn't just concerned about giving us the comfort of knowing that, that he's there to help us when we have worries and anxieties about physical problems. There are actually some bigger problems that God wants to help us with, and that he wants us to recognize. Our Savior wants us to humble ourselves and to recognize our limitations especially in the spiritual struggles that we have in this life. The Holy Spirit inspired Peter to go on and to say in our text, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Now, how often in your life are you anxious and worried about Satan? How often have you spent a sleepless night worried about this, the devil's attacks against you. It's a lot easier, isn't it, to be worried and anxious about the bills or about health problems because we can see those things, we can feel those things. 
You can see and touch that, that bill that comes in the mail. You can see the reminder in your email inbox. You can feel the symptoms of, of your throat getting scratchy or your limbs getting weak when you're ill. But we don't see Satan. And so it's easy to forget the danger that he poses. In fact, when you and I picture Satan, what, what image comes to your mind? When you hear that name Satan, what's the, the mental picture you paint for yourself? Does it almost look kind of halfway cartoonish? A guy with some red skin who has horns and moves and, and holds a pitchfork? Maybe you even picture him pint-sized enough to fit on your shoulder and whisper in your ear. Hardly intimidating. Peter pictures the devil in a very different light. He pictures him as a lion. A lion who's prowling around, who's actively in this world, who's close at hand. A lion who's roaring as he charges through the brush to jump on you and tear, take you back to his lair. And this, this lion saint, he is not after just simply your health or your wealth or even your life. He's after your faith. He's after your place in heaven. Martin Luther had it right when in one of his hymns he, he called Satan the old evil foe and went on to say, now means deadly woe. Deep guide and great might are his dread arms and fight. On this earth is not his equal. You and I, we are not up to the task of facing Satan down. That's a contest we're going to lose every time by ourselves. He is an evil angel, and that means he has all the power of an evil angel at his disposal. Our might is puny and insignificant next to his. And he's got the edge in experience. He's been involved in this battle for millennia. He's been battling believers throughout all creation. He's a veteran. And yet you and I, so often we foolishly make the mistake of underestimating Satan's power. We look at life and we think, oh, the sun is shining, life is going well, I can handle anything. And we forget the power of Satan. Or we go about our day-to-day -day business and we're concerned about the things of this earth and we forget that Satan is on the battlefield. And when we do that, we play right into his hands. We play right into Satan's hands when we're more concerned about, oh, well, maybe getting the kids to soccer practice or piano lessons than getting them to church every week. We play right into Satan's hands. We give him the edge when we are more focused and more worried about taking care of our bodies, worrying about the roof over our heads and having a nice house and maintaining a certain lifestyle than we are about feeding our souls. The enemy Satan is the greatest enemy we have and he is so far beyond our ability to deal with by ourselves. That's why God says humble yourself. That's why he had Peter go on, not just simply to paint this terrifying picture of Satan as a roaring lion, an old evil foe. But Peter goes on to write, resist firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish, him, establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Peter doesn't just urge you to humble yourself so that you, you see the danger that Satan poses. He urges you to humble yourself, to see the assistance that your Savior God provides. Just think of, of the promises God made in those verses. He promised to help you resist Satan by standing firm in the faith, by holding on to those precious words and promises of God. The Lord promises himself to restore and strengthen, confirm and establish you through his means of grace. And ultimately, to lift you out of this struggle to himself and 
God promises to help you resist the attacks of the devil and his lies. He promises to help you overcome the attacks of the devil and his lies. He promises ultimately to remove you from the attacks of the devil and his lies by taking you to eternal life. And God isn't just talk. He's action. He has the power to follow through. That's because God is the one who has crushed Satan. In fact, I don't know if you've ever realized this, but the very first promise of the gospel, the very first promise to send a Savior, was spoken in terms specifically directed at crushing Satan's power. In the Garden of Eden, when Satan tempted and led Adam and Eve into sin, that first gospel promise was actually addressed to Satan, spoken in the presence of Adam and Eve. And God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. At the cross, Christ's heel was indeed bruised, but Satan's head was crushed. Satan's power was undone and shattered by that blood of Jesus poured out there on the cross. And through faith in Jesus, that victory over Satan is a victory that God makes yours. And yours, and, and yes, even yours. God makes you a victor over Satan by that work of Christ. And so your Savior urges you to humble yourself. And not to face Satan on your own. But to receive the strength and might that he provides through faith in Christ. I do it myself, a bold and yet childish declaration of independence. I do it myself, God spare us from that kind of thinking when it comes to the anxieties of this life and more importantly when it comes to the assaults and attacks of that roaring lion, Satan. Rather may you and I humble ourselves. May we recognize our limitations against those, especially those spiritual problems that we face. And instead, may we look and focus our eyes on that Savior Jesus, the one who lifts us up to eternal life. Amen. Please stand. Now the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus to life everlasting.